Hey guys, we're on chapter 16. Tune in. Let's see what happens. Meanwhile, on the other side of town, George's dad was enjoying his environmental protest march. Holding up huge signs and shouting slogans, the campaigners charged across the shopping district, batting the crowds aside. The planet is dying, they yelled as they marched in the town square. Recycle plastic bags, ban the car, they bellowed as surprised passerbys. Stop wasting the Earth's resources, they yelled. When they jumped on in the middle of the square, George's dad jumped onto the base of the statue and gave a speech. Now is the time to start worrying. Not tomorrow, he began. No one heard him. So one of his friends handed him a megaphone. We don't have that many years left to save the planet, he repeated, this time so loudly that everyone in the area could hear him. If the Earth's temperature continues to rise, he went on, by the end of the century, flood and droughts will kill thousands and force over 200 million people to flee from their homes. Much of the world will become uninhabitable. Food production will collapse and people will starve. Technology will not be able to save us because it will be too late. A few people in the crowd were clapping and nodding their heads. George's dad felt quite surprised. He'd been coming to these marches for years and years, handing out flyers and giving speeches, and he got quite used to having people ignore him or telling him he was crazy because he believed that too many people owned cars, caused too much pollution, and relied too heavily on energy-consuming machines. And now, suddenly, people were listening to the environmental horror story he'd been talking about for so long. The polar ice caps are melting, the seas are rising, the climate is getting warmer and warmer, he went on. The advances in science and technology have given us the power to destroy our planet. Now we need to work on how to save it. By now, a little group of Saturday shoppers had stopped to hear what he had to say. A small cheer went up from the people listening. It's time to save our planet, yelled George's dad. Save our planet, the campaigners shouted back, and one or two shoppers started joining in. Save our planet. Save our planet. A few more people cheered, and da George's dad lifted his arms in the air in a victorious salute. He felt very excited. At last, people were taking notice of some of the terrible state that the planet was in. He suddenly realized that all those years he had spent trying to raise public awareness were not lost after all. It was starting to work, and all of the eco-friendly groups had not protested in vain. When the cheers trailed off, George's dad was about to speak again when suddenly, out of nowhere, a huge custard pie sailed across the heads of the crowd and hit him right in the face. There was a burst of shocked silence and then everyone burst out laughing at the sight of poor George's dad standing there in a runny cream dripping down his beard. Wriggling through the onlookers, a group of boys dressed in Halloween costumes started running away from the square. Catch them, shouted someone in the crowd, pointing to the band of masked figures sprinting away. George's dad didn't really mind at all. After people had been throwing things at him for years while he made speeches and he had been arrested, jostled, insulted, thrown out of so many places in his efforts to make people understand the danger the planet faced, that one more custard pie didn't upset him very much. He just wiped the sticky goo out of his eyes and got ready to continue talking. A few other green campaigners ran after the group of demons, devils, and zombies, but they were soon left behind, staggering and gasping for breath. When the boys realized the grown-ups had given up the chase, they came to a stop. Ha ha ha, they snickered, ripping off the zombie mask to reveal features of Ringo. His real face wasn't more attractive than the rubber mask. That was great, said Whippet, stripping off his black and white scream mask. The way you threw that pie? Yeah, said the enormous devil, swishing his tail and waving his pitchfork. You got him right in the nose. Judging by his great size, it could be none other than Tank, the boy who couldn't stop growing. <clears throat> I love Halloween, said Ringo happily. No one will ever know it was us. What should we do next, said Zit, who was d dressed as Zachar... Z Z dressed as Dracula. Well, we've got to run out of pies, said Ringo, so we're going to have to play some tricks now, some good ones. I've got some ideas. By late afternoon, the boys had given quite a few people living in their small town a bad fright. They'd shot an old lady with colored water from a toy pistol, they'd thrown purple flour over a group of small kids, and they'd set off firecrackers under a parked car, making its owner think they'd blown it up. Each time, they had caused as much havoc as they possibly could and scampered away before anyone could catch them. Now they had reached the very end of town, where the houses started to spread out. Instead of the narrow streets with rows of snug little cottages, the buildings got bigger and farther apart. These houses had long green laws in front of them with big hedges and crunchy gravel driveways. It was getting dark, and some of these enormous houses with blank windows, columns, and fancy front doors were starting to look quite eerie in the dim light. Most of them were dark and silent, so the gang didn't even bother ringing their bell. They were just about to give up when the woman at the very last house came, and a huge rambling place with turrets and crumbling statues and old iron gates hanging off the hinges. On the ground floor, lights were blazing. Last one, said Ringo, so let's make it a good one. Tricks ready? His band of boys cheered their stat 
checked their stash of trick weapons, and hurried along behind him up the, over the weed-covered driveway. But as they approached the house, they all noticed a strange, eggy smell, which grew stronger as they approached. Who? We, said the devil, holding his nose. Was it me, said Zit. Who smelt it? Who dealt it? said Ringo. The smell was getting so bad that the boys were finding it hard to breathe as they came towards the front door. The paint was peeling off the woodwork. The air itself became thick and gray. Hand over mouth and nose, Ringo reached forward and pressed the giant round doorbell. It made a sad, lonely, clanging noise, although it wasn't used to it very often. To the boys' surprise, the door creaked a crack and the fingers of a yellowish-gray smoke curled through the narrow gap. Yes, said an unpleasant voice that was somehow familiar. Trick or treat, said Ringo, almost unable to speak. Trick! cried the voice, throwing up in the door, and for a fleeting second, the, the boy saw a man wearing an old-fashioned gas mask standing in the doorway. Another second, the great clouds of stinky yellow and gray smoke rolled through the door, and the man vanished from view. Run! Ringo yelled. His gang didn't need telling twice. They had already turned their tail and were rushing back through the thick smog. Panting and wheezing, they staggered down the driveway, through the gates, and onto the pavement. They ripped off their Halloween costumes so they could breathe, because uh, they after choking on the smelly smoke. But Ringo wasn't with them. He had tripped in the driveway and fallen. He was struggling to his feet when he saw the man from the big house walking towards him. Help, help, he yelled. The other members of his gang stopped and turned around, but no one wanted to go back. Quick, said Zit, who was smallest. Go and save Ringo. The other two just shuffled awkwardly and mumbled. The spooky man wasn't wearing a gas mask anymore, and the boys could almost make out his features of through the clearing smoke. Ringo was standing up now, and the man seemed to be speaking to him, although the other boys couldn't hear what he said. After a few minutes, Ringo turned and waved his gang. Hey, he shouted, all of you, get over here. Who do you think it is? Reluctantly, the other three straggled towards him, and strangely, Ringo seemed very pleased with himself. Standing next to him, looking just a tiny bit sinister, was none other than Mr. Looper. <laughs> 